Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Nada Youssef. If you're a woman that suffers from accidental or involuntary loss of control of your bladder, please stay tuned. Women experience incontinence twice as often as men. Pregnancy, childbirth, menopause, and the structure of the female urinary tract all account to this. Rightfully so, it could be very difficult to talk about, and that's why we're here today. And please send in any questions you may have regarding this subject in the comment section below. And for today's topic, we have with us urogynecologist Dr. Katie Probst. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And if you just want to go ahead and introduce yourself to our uh, viewers. Sure. So my name is Katie Probst. I'm a urogynecologist here at the Cleveland Clinic. I've been practicing here for about a year. I take care of patients who suffer from prolapse and incontinence and other pelvic floor disorders. Great, great. And what kind of patients would see you versus uh, just a primary care? Sure, that's a great question. So often patients will come to me directly, but these, are, these concerns with incontinence or prolapse are, are warranted to bring them up to your primary physician or your gynecologist, for, and then they can, you can be further referred to me if it's necessary. Great, thank you. Um, and before we begin, please remember this is for informational purposes only and it's not intended to replace your own physician's advice. So many people with incontinence, I can imagine it's difficult to bring that up and um, a lot of people learn to cope with it or just mm -hmm. live with it. Um, so let's kind of start with a very general explanation of what the urinary system is composed of. Sure. So the urinary system is composed of the kidneys where the urine is made mm -hmm. and then the urine is, travels into the bladder from the ureters. Those are tubes carrying urine from the kidneys down into the bladder. Mm -hmm. And then in the bladder, urine is stored until we're ready to empty the bladder where the urine is released through the, the urethra. Okay, and that would be the process of urination then? Sure. Okay. So, well, typically our bladders are storing urine most of the time and then we're, we're ready to urinate. That's when the bladder um, contracts and the urine is emptied. Okay, so when do things go wrong? Well, things may go wrong at different times. Generally, when we think about urine leakage, something is going wrong during what we call the storage phase of urine. Okay. Because during the storage phase, urine is supposed to remain in the bladder. So at, during the storage phase, the bladder muscle and wall may be overactive, causing an urge and leakage with, with that contraction. Mm -hmm. Or um, the ure urethra, where the, which carries the urine into the toilet, may may be weakened and not supported well and then urine is allowed to leak out with physical activity. Sure. Now when we talk about the pelvic floor, mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about what is the pelvic floor mm -hmm. and what disorders come with it. The pelvic floor is really a set of muscles that cover the opening of the bony pelvis. Oh, okay. And so those muscles work to support the bladder, the uterus and vagina, and the rectum. Okay. Um, when things go wrong with those muscles, we can have a prolapse, which is basically a herniation mm -hmm. or a bulging of the pelvic organs into the vaginal canal or out of the vaginal canal. Sure. Uh, urine leakage can occur or bladder control problems and bowel control problems can also occur with pelvic floor problems. Are there symptoms that, you know, once we have it, we know that something may be wrong with our pelvic floor? Yeah, so patients may complain of urine leakage okay. at inconvenient times. Um, bowel leakage or trouble emptying the bowels okay. or just a sense of a bulge or pressure in the vagina. Okay. Is constipation a symptom of this? It can be, okay. but not always. Okay. I think a physical exam and taking more history from the patient can also often help to sort out those kinds of questions. Sure. And now when we talk about urinary incontinence, are there different types of urinary incontinence? There are. There are a number of types of urinary incontinence. I would say the most common types in women are stress incontinence, and that's leakage of urine with activity, or really anything that puts pressure on the bladder. Okay. For some women, that would be sports, and for other women with more severe stress incontinence, that may just be a sneeze or walking. Another type is overactive bladder and urge incontinence, and that's, as I mentioned earlier, when the bladder wall muscle mm -hmm. is um, overactive and squeezes too often and that can cause urgency and leakage of urine. Okay. Um, and these conditions can happen simultaneously so some patients may have both urge and stress incontinence. With stress incontinence it kind of sounds to me like if someone went through childbearing or pregnancy or is this also could be before? It could happen before but most women who have stress incontinence um, have had some event that leads to some weakening of the support of the urethra that mm -hmm. carries the urine out of the bladder. Okay. Um, and childbirth is a major risk factor for that. I see. Yes. And, and how is that diagnosed? Just in 
incontinence in general? Typically, all types of incontinence begin with taking a history from the patient and understanding when the leakage occurs and, um, and how long it's been going on. Sure and um, understanding how it impacts the quality of life because a lot of our these conditions we treat based on their impact of quality of life. Sure. Um, so once we, we gather a history, a physical examination is the next step and then further testing may be indicated but it depends on that patient's situation. So if someone's going through uh, urinary incontinence, do they go straight to a primary care physician or can they go straight to a urogynecologist? Well, I think it makes sense to see your primary care physician first. Okay. Some patients do present directly to me for urinary incontinence, and I think that's appropriate. Many patients prefer to see a physician they already have a relationship with, like right. their primary care doctor or their gynecologist, or they can come straight to see a urogynecologist. Okay. Now, would you say this disorder is like a normal part of aging for women? Well, age, increasing age is a risk factor for, for urinary incontinence, but it's not a normal part of aging. It's not normal. Okay, and, and then so causes, it could be like age can overweight uh, people. Yes, obesity can contribute to urinary incontinence sure. and there are studies showing that patients who are overweight who lost weight can actually improve their urine leakage in the case of stress incontinence. Okay. Now, I know a lot of uh, women that maybe after having kids, after especially having multiple kids, mm -hmm. that will say that they will urinate a little bit after sneezing or anything mm -hmm. like that. When is it normal and when is it like this is this doesn't sound normal I need to go see a doctor? Well, in general that's not normal. Okay. I would say um, whether or not to seek treatment depends on how bothersome it is. Some patients may find that they have that leakage once a month mm -hmm. and they don't feel that it's bothersome. Right. They probably don't necessarily need treatment. Okay. Um, however, if someone's leaking multiple times a day and finds it bothersome, then that an intervention or a treatment might make sense. And just like you were talking about quality of life. If exactly. It's, if it's, it's really all about how the leakage affects the patient's life and if they find it to be bothersome. Great, great. And um, how about medications? Can medications cause incontinence? Because I feel like I've read a lot about that. There definitely are medications that can cause or worsen incontinence. Mm -hmm. um, and that really depends a lot on the patient's specific situation, their anatomy, and um, what other risk factors they have, and what total what medications they're using. Sure, sure. Okay, well before I keep going, I am getting some live questions, okay. so I'm gonna read some of those out here. I have first, I have Mike. My mother-in-law has a situation where urine leaks uncontrollably. She's done several tests and nothing could be found wrong with her. What could be the problem? Well, I, it's hard to know specifically um, because we don't have a lot of details of Mike's mother's symptoms, sure. but I think in this case, Oftentimes, this is where the history is really important to understand when the leakage is happening. Sure. Um, maybe nothing is wrong in terms of a specific cause for the incontinence, so it may be stress urinary incontinence or overactive bladder. Okay. So I think further evaluation, perhaps by a gynecologist or a urogynecologist, could be useful in this situation. Very good, thank you. And then I have Carla. I had the TOT procedure about eight years ago. It is no longer working. I leak all the time. Is there any type of physical exercises to strengthen the bladder? And before I let you answer, if I can have you tell us what is a TOT procedure for those who don't sure. know. Sure, that's a great question. So the TOT procedure is a type of sling that's used to treat stress incontinence. Okay. Um, TOT just has to do with how the sling is placed. Okay. Um, now, the reason that Carla's still having leakage many years after her TOT procedure could be for several reasons. Mm -hmm. It could be that she has more than one type of incontinence. It could also be that the sling is no longer working, so she would need further evaluation to determine what's the case. Um, what I would say, though, to the question about um, exercises to help with the leakage, pelvic floor exercises or Kegel contractions can help with urinary incontinence. Um, it's important to understand how to use the exercise to help the incontinence. Sure. For, um, it's, it's important to exercise the muscles regularly to make them strong, to have good control of them, but just doing those contractions won't help the incontinence. They have the Kegel exercises have to be used at times of stress activities that cause leakage or to suppress urges for overactive bladder. Okay. So it might be useful for Carla to follow up with um, her urogynecologist or gynecologist to determine what type of leakage she's having so we can best understand how she should use those exercises sure. to improve her leakage. Great, and speaking of that, what lifestyle choices can worsen 
there are definitely things we can do in daily life to make incontinence worse, and that's drinking excessive fluids can certainly worsen incontinence. We know certain things can irritate the bladder, like alcohol and caffeine and smoking. So often these are important components in treating urinary incontinence. Very, very good to know. Thank you. And then I have uh, Barbara. Uh, I'm a 70-year-old with two children, no dribbles yet, but what can I do to stop them in the future? So that's a great question. I think for anyone having good bladder hygiene, as we just talked about some of the things that can actually worsen bladder function, like avoiding excessive alcohol and caffeine sure. and uh, avoiding smoking or quitting smoking can help prevent these things in the future. And also those Kegel exercises can help keep the pelvic floor healthy, so mm -hmm. that can be helpful as well. Great, and then for Kegel exercises, is it just like normal to just kinda like YouTube what to do or do you go purchase something or a program or what do you That's suggest? That's a great question. I think um, that varies per patient. Some yeah. patients are very good and able to uh, easily squeeze the pelvic floor. Others may have difficulty locating those muscles or contracting them at all. Okay. So I think it's reasonable to try videos. That's fine. I think um, there are, are some devices available on the market to give you feedback if you're actually squeezing the muscles. Um. I think if when, when you see your gynecologist to say, can you check my Kegel squeeze and tell me if I'm squeezing the right muscle can be really helpful. Yeah. In patients who can do a good squeeze, practicing at home is reasonable. Sure. For those who have a hard time identifying the muscles or squeezing at all, sometimes pelvic floor physical therapy can be really helpful in those situations. And Kegel exercises could be used by any female. You don't have to go through incontinence to do it. Is that correct? That's or correct. That's, that's a good yeah. muscle to exercise. Absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, I have uh, Nor Norberta. Um, can you talk more about bladder prolapse? So prolapse is a condition where the pelvic organs, and in this case that we're re referencing is the bladder, herniate or bulge down into the vaginal canal. Mm -hmm. And this has a number of, of treatment options. One, like urinary incontinence, is to just observe the condition if it's not bothersome. Exercises can be helpful. There are devices that can go in the vagina to support the prolapse, and we also have surgeries that we can use to treat prolapse as well. Okay. And I think in the case of, of bladder prolapse, it would be appropriate to be seen by a urogynecologist. Okay. And while we're talking about treatments and solutions, can we talk about um, those treatments and solutions and lifestyle changes that we can do as mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. uh, to prevent from, from happening? Right, so um, that's a good question. So we talked a little bit about some of the lifestyle things in terms of managing fluids, not drinking excessively, right. um, avoiding excessive caffeine or alcohol, and avoiding smoking. Um, and I, I think also there are, are concepts of good bladder hygiene okay. in terms of um, going to the bathroom somewhat frequently, but um, sometimes if we go too frequently, that can reinforce an, um, an urgency pattern for the bladder. Really? It can. So I think, um, and if you have questions about what's normal bladder function, that's a good thing to talk about with yeah. your gynecologist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then for incontinence, would you talk about like weight loss, um, things that we can do, physical therapy, things like mm -hmm. that as well? That we can yeah, do? weight loss can be helpful in mm -hmm. some situations, especially for stress incontinence. Physical therapy can also be helpful. Um, as I mentioned before, I think that's most helpful for women who have trouble controlling those pelvic floor muscles. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And then I know in our uh, Health Essentials uh, health site for Cleveland Clinic, we talk about this uh, tampon looking device mm -hmm. for urinary incontinence. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there is a device that you can purchase over the counter that's yeah. inserted into the vagina like a tampon. Yeah. And once placed, it expands in an effort to support the urethra. Okay. So it's a way of supporting the urethra while avoiding surgery. And that would be for stress incontinence, so leakage with activity, coughing or sneezing or running. And I think this device is most useful for women who have very specific activities that provoke the incontinence. Right. So for some women, they may only leak when they exercise or you know jump on the trampoline with their children and maybe that's the time that they use the I device. See, so it's not like a daily thing, you would use it when you're highly active. Exactly. Okay. I mean I think it, it could be used daily but most women find that that kind of uh, maintenance it be, it would be cumbersome right. but it could be used daily. Right. And when do you think surgery is needed then? Well when, when to proceed with surgery really is based on that impact on the patient's quality of life. Right. So um, typically what I like to do with patients is understand how things are impacting their life, review the treatment options, 
and then give them a choice of how they'd like to proceed. Some right. patients are ready to proceed directly to surgery when I've met them, mm -hmm. and others feel that it's not warranted and want to try Kegel exercises yeah. or one of these devices that we're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, I have Carmen. Uh, what can you do to control stress incontinence? I know we kind of talked about some of this stuff. Yeah, we've mentioned th some of those things. Uh, let's see here. And then you've mentioned not smoking. Um, can you discuss the connection of smoking and the bladder? That's a great question. Yeah. And that connection is not well understood. What we believe is that um, most likely that there are, are byproducts of the nicotine that are excreted in the urine, mm. and those byproducts irritate the bladder and cause contractions within the bladder wall. The byproducts, like what are we talking, are we talking about like the toxins coming out? Correct. I see, okay, yes. okay, very, very good, okay. And then Cindy, can the bladder, uh, can the bladder tuck be done more than once? Well, I think Cindy's referring to a repair of a bladder prolapse, uh -huh. and that can be done more than once. It, it is, okay, okay, great. And then uh, Melinda, does wearing a, is it pessary? Pessary. Health? Pessary health bladder issues. And what is that, I guess um, I'll ask. <laughs> well, that's a good question. A pessary is a silicone device that's placed in the vagina. Typically, they're used to support prolapse, okay. so that's the bulging of the pelvic organs into the vaginal canal. Um, some pessaries are made to help with urine leakage, mm -hmm. and um, those are stress, in stress incontinence pessaries. They help to support the urethra, and they can certainly improve urine leakage with activity. Often they don't allow complete resolution of the leakage, but they can help. Okay. Sometimes when patients have prolapse of the bladder, they can also develop urinary urgency or incomplete bladder emptying. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the pessary can help by supporting the bladder better. It allows for better bladder emptying and improvement of that urgency and incomplete emptying. Sure. So um, from what you've said before, you're saying that muscles usually is the, the biggest uh, culprit here. Mm -hmm. Is that including not being able to empty your urine? Would that also be a muscle issue or um, is that something else? It could be not being able to empty your bladder well has many different causes. Okay. But say the pelvic muscles aren't working well and therefore the bladder isn't well supported, sometimes the bladder doesn't empty well. It can, the bladder can pool urine because it's in an abnormal position. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. And then uh, I have Melinda. Do all women get this problem? Can you share some treatment plans? So not all women develop incontinence. Mm -hmm. For women who have overactive bladder, or that's the leaking with the feeling of needing to go urgently and frequently, mm -hmm. those women often we do a stepwise treatment approach. Okay. So we first would discuss behavioral treatments that we've talked about. Sometimes I have those women do a bladder diary, and that helps us to identify things in their daily life uh -huh. that may be w making the incontinence worse. If that's not helpful, there are some medications we can try. And if medications aren't helpful, there are some procedures available to help with overactive bladder and urge leakage. Mm -hmm. For women who have stress incontinence, we've reviewed some of those treatments, um, such as that pelvic floor exercises, yep. the pessary or the tampon device, and then we have some surgeries available as well. Now, bladder diary. I'm mm -hmm. curious. What, <laughs> tell me what, what kind of that? things, just like how many times you go if you're, if you're leaking. Yeah, or so a bladder diary is helpful in patients who describe incontinence that doesn't fit a particular diagnosis mm -hmm. or in whom we think that some of their behaviors may be playing a big role in their bladder problems. So I typically have patients do a two-day bladder diary where they record how often they go to the bathroom. I'll have them record how much they peed, actually the volume of urine. Um, and they also will record when they leaked and what they were doing and how much they drank. So try to figure out exactly mm -hmm. what kind of incontinence they have. Correct. All right. And then I have uh, Khalil. Can incontinence be prevented? That's a great question. It depends a little bit on each patient's situation, but it can be prevented, I think, with um, some of the lifestyle factors that we've discussed. Okay, great. And Deb, my doctor suggested I try not drinking tea, and it worked. Why? Is it caffeine? Likely, yes. It's probably the caffeine, and it may also be a volume issue as well. Mm -hmm. The caffeine may have irritated the bladder, and as she eliminated tea, she may have had a reduction in the amount of fluids she was drinking. That also likely helped. So caffeine does irritate the bladder? That's it does. The, the, the product itself. It irritates the bladder. It also is what we call a diuretic, which means it causes us to make more urine. It increases the urine production in the kidneys. So not only does it irritate the bladder, there's more volume of urine. I see. 
All right, very, very good to know. And then Joyce, uh, should you stay away from diet pop? Everybody should stay away from diet <laughs> pop, but I'm not really sure this <laughs> Does it have to do with urinary um, incontinence? It can irritate the bladder. So there are some well-known bladder irritants. Okay. Diet pop is one of them because it may have caffeine in it. Yeah. Artificial sweeteners can also irritate the bladder. And we know in some patients, carbonated beverages, the carbonation can be uh -huh. irritating as well. Oh, interesting. All right. And then uh, Drinda, what success, <coughs> have Excuse you, me. Sorry, uh, what success have you found with bladder pacemaker? The bladder pacemaker. That's a great question. I think that... Um, that she's referring to a device that's currently being researched. Okay. The, there's a bladder pacemaker that um, is being studied here at the Cleveland Clinic to measure bladder pressure. And this, could, this has some potential applications for controlling the bladder urges and for measuring pressure in the bladder to evaluate what's going on before we can provide treatment to sure. get the right diagnosis. Um, this is a device we're studying, so it hasn't been studied yet in humans, so we're okay. still, it's not currently available to patients, but it's something that maybe has promise for the future. All right, so we'll stay tuned for that. And then uh, Trina, what about exposure to cold or bare feet on cold floors that cause a sudden urgency to urinate and dribbles begin? That's a great question, and I, I you know, I don't know the mechanism for this. I definitely have patients who describe this to me. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's a, probably a component of urge incontinence, yeah. um, but I don't know the mechanism for the trigger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could think about it like just being cold. You, you mm -hmm. feel like you want to urinate yeah. more, right? <laughs> it's like the sense of it. Um, Gayla, uh, what can I do about bladder spasms? I start to leak when my brain knows I'm headed to the bathroom. That's a great question. So, so what Gail is describing is overactive bladder and urge incontinence. Okay. So, so much about diagnosing types of urinary incontinence has to do with patient history. So, it sounds based on this um, small amount of information that this is probably overactive bladder. But I, so, I think evaluation with a physician would be warranted in this situation to talk about treatment. Great. And then, uh, Terry, can this condition be hereditary? Is there any link to family history? We do believe so, especially okay. for overactive bladder. We find that this does tend to run in families. Okay. okay. So yeah. that's. And then I have Jeannie. Does a prolapsed bladder cause UTIs? That's a tough question. Yeah. In some women, if the prolapse is severe and the bladder isn't emptying well, sometimes the urine pools and doesn't empty, and that can be a risk factor for urinary tract infections. Okay. But many patients who have that condition also have other risk factors for urinary tract infections okay. so sometimes it's related so uti is that is that a usual symptom of urinary incontinence so not typically okay. i would say generally urinary incontinence can happen because of a urinary tract infection right um but typically that would be more acute or quick in onset so patients who've had leakage of urine for five years probably it's not from a urinary tract infection right right I, Incontinence doesn't cause urinary tract infections. Okay, good to know. Very good. And then Barbara, I get chronic UTIs. Is there a natural preventative? That's a good question. So um, not very easy to answer. I don't think that there's a natural preventative that we know of. Not cranberry juice. Not either. cranberry <laughs> juice. I mean, the, the data for cranberry tablets and cranberry juice is very mixed. Oh, really? What okay. I would say is it's probably not harmful to use cranberry tablets, but it may not be helpful. Right. In terms of cranberry juice, there's a lot of sugar in juice. So uh, when we think about those things, um, it maybe is not the best ideal for your overall health, depending what other medical conditions you may have. Very, very good information. Thank you. And then Melissa, uh, just tuned in. I had my first baby and it was a C-section. Is it normal to now have bladder issues? Um, so. It depends. A, we need a little more information to be able to clarify this exactly, but mm -hmm. what I would say is urinary problems aren't uncommon after delivery, even right. after C-section. We know that typically urinary incontinence that occurs after delivery does tend to get better with time. So it depends a little bit on the specific delivery situation and how long it's been since the birth. Okay. Um, but I think if, if it's not improving with time after several months from delivery, it would be a good time to get an evaluation. Why do bladder issues not matter if you get a C-section? Is it just the pressure of pregnancy or what is well, it? Well, um, what we know is that pregnancy in general puts some pressure on those pelvic floor muscles that are so important for bladder function. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's more pressure on the pelvic floor muscles at the time of vaginal delivery versus C-section. Okay. So 
probably there are more bladder issues after a vaginal delivery than a C-section. Good. Now, I wanted to ask you also, what, do, what role does the pelvic floor muscle play in bowel problems? Because I know here in mm -hmm. the Cleveland Clinic, there's a, mu a multidisciplinary approach to this, correct? Can we talk about That's that a little true. bit? That's true. So within the urogynecology division, we do collaborate with... Um, with colorectal surgery and urology and um, gastroenterology to manage problems that are more complex. Okay. So in some patients, there may be problems with the bowels and the pelvic floor, and sometimes surgery from a team approach is warranted. That's great, all right. And then I have a few more questions for you. I have Tammy. How often should you do pelvic floor exercises and how many minutes a day? You're gonna say depends, aren't you? It does depend <laughs> a little bit, but there are some basic tenets that are important to observe. Okay. Um, in the same way, when you go to the gym, you don't start out by running a full marathon the day you start. <laughs> so I would recommend anyone who's practicing to begin with fewer repetitions okay. and then to slowly work up the same way you would train any muscle. Okay, great. And then, Anita, uh, the testing seems archaic or old-fashioned. Is there any other way to get a diagnosis? Well, it depends a little on the patient's situation. Um, this uh, call, uh, questioner, uh, Anita, Anita right may be referring to urodynamic testing, okay. which is, is pretty invasive that we perform in the office. I see. And mm -hmm. what we try to do within our division is perform this testing only when it's warranted. So if we're able to get a history and a physical exam that clearly supports a diagnosis, often we're able to move forward without doing formal testing. It really depends on that specific patient situation. Sure. All right, great. And then I'll have, sorry, one more question for you. I have Julie. Um, can these disorders lead to complications with pregnancy? Not typically. If we're talking about urinary incontinence, uh, that doesn't usually cause complications in pregnancy. It does not? No. Okay. okay. All right. And then, uh, okay, one more came in, so <laughs> I'll give Brenda one more chance here. I'm 66 <laughs> now, and when I have to pee, I must go right away. As a young person, I could hold it much longer. What is wrong? Well, there are several things that could be going on. It may be that the pelvic floor muscles have become weakened over life, and mm -hmm. so it's um, harder to use them to control the bladder. It also could be, as we talked about, overactive bladder is a condition that can cause urinary urgency and frequency. Sure. So, um, so it's hard to know exactly what the problem is, um, but there are a couple of different things that could be going on. Right, right. All right, well, we are all out of time, but before mm -hmm. I let you go, is there anything else you wanted to share with our audience? Did we talk um, about everything? I think we talk, covered <laughs> talked everything. About a lot, Thanks right? for tuning in. Sure thing. Thank you. And for more information on female incontinence or to make an appointment with a Cleveland Clinic physician, you can call us at 216-444-6601. And for more health news and information, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Cleveland Clinic, one word. Thank you. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>